Just start. Um, so welcome everybody to the uh, monthly Saturday morning class at the North London Buddhist Centre. Um, I know some of you come regularly and some of you are here for the first time. Uh, my name is uh, Karen Agita and I'm one of many people who uh, teach at the centre. I realised as I was um, meditating over there that I've uh, been around the centre now for 30 years, which is half my life. That's uh, so quite a while. <laughs> and um, anyway, so we're starting each um, on the Saturday mornings. We have um, a number of different themes, a sort of rolling themes, and we're starting a new theme um, this month. And it's um, the theme is which is going to run for three months. And it's uh, one of many uh, Buddhist lists. Uh, this one is called the three Lakshanas, the three marks of conditioned existence. You don't need to I'm going to unpack that a bit. Um, so it's yeah, three aspects of um, everything we experience in our ordinary uh, experience, really. And it, um, it's a very, very, it's completely core fundamental Buddhist teaching that describes this is how things are. This is uh, what reality is. Um, and so the um, and actually, when I was thinking about this as a sort of the talk on the first one, which is uh, impermanence, I was thinking about it. They're, they're just so intimately entwined, really, that it's impossible to talk about one of them without um, referencing the others. Um, so um, this first talk is um, around um, impermanence, which is uh, traditionally the first of what's termed the sort of three lakshanas or the three marks. There's a seat just here. Um, and um, so impermanence as in not permanent, as in changing. And um, but the other two, but they're, they're sort of intimately linked with the other two. So um, from this perspective of the three Lakshanas, um, everything is constantly changing and ending um, because there is this constant flow happening and um, nothing has any sort of fixed substance to it. Nothing has a sort of graspable core that you can hold on to and keep. Um, that is unchanging. So those two things are intimately linked, the um, uh, impermanence and then this thing of insubstantiality, the lack of a fixed core um, for everything, including including ourselves. Um, and then the third of the three lakshanas is, uh, is termed um, dukkha or unsatisfactoriness, sort of an unease with experience. And that is based on our response to that reality, that everything is a sort of changing flow that we can't hold on to. That even if we sort of, um, on the surface of it, we think, yep, that's great, got that. You know, we can see through our responses to things that actually we're not comfortable with it. You know, at some point, something will happen and we'll just think, and then you think, okay, something in me is not comfortable with this. So those are the three Lakshanas impermanence, insubstantiality, and uh, unsatisfactoriness or dukkha. And you've got one talk on each of those um, over the next three months. And this one um, is on uh, impermanence. Um, but what I really want to um, focus on in this is, so what does this mean for us? What does this mean for how we practice? Wherever you're at in terms of you know, Buddhism or meditation or initial curiosity around those things. It doesn't matter at all. This is a sort of open to all levels uh, class. But that's the thing I want to focus on. So what does that mean for us and for how, for how we practice? Um, so impermanence, not permanent, changing, ending. Um, I mean, when I was thinking about it, I was thinking, well, that is really obvious for some things and it's really not obvious for other things. Also, the fact that things change and end is really welcome for some things and it's really not welcome for other things. So I'm gonna unpack that a bit. But within that, what matters for us and in terms of how we practice 
um, within the context of Buddhism, meditation, spirituality, whatever it is, or self-development, what's important and what matters is our response um, to that reality, the reality of impermanence. And um, how we respond will be based on our level of understanding um, and acceptance of the fact that it is happening which as I say sometimes we only know by how we do actually then how we do actually respond when sort of change happens so what I'm going to do in this talk which I know will end but I'm not quite sure when but it won't be that long um, is first of all I'm going to look at some examples of impermanence that of, of you know that we encounter in our experience um, and um, then I'm going to look at how we practice in relation to that truth, the truth of impermanence. And in terms of looking at how we practice, I'm going to look at four different aspects of that. Um, one is simply observing the change, the changing nature of whatever it is. The second will be um, how we're responding to that, what our response is to the fact that it's changing. And the third is uh, practice in relation to increasing our uh, acceptance and calm and positivity in relation to that. And the fourth is um, practice in relation to the some more insight realization aspect and how observing that impermanence can be a way in to that as well. And then there will be time for questions at the end. So um examples of impermanence change these are these are quite mundane <laughs> and they'll come up for all of you but I, I wanted to look at examples where there was you know an in, um they were maybe increasingly hard to see the change within so some things as i say are really easy to see so one of the things that gokiyasaki was uh, signaling at the end of the meditation was around sound um, you know, the, we, we notice the impermanence of silence in the meditation, because obviously there's building work opposite, which, um, but anyway, they, they look like they're going home now, so we've got more silence, but anyway, so, but some of those things, so sound, obviously, that, that's a very easy thing to see, the change in it. Another really useful example that's uh, easy to see is weather. Weather is such a useful thing to focus on in terms of practice partly because we often have quite big responses to it, but also just for the purpose of this bit of um, describing it, we're aware that weather changes. I mean, we're also aware that we're not in control of weather changing, so that's helpful as well for practice, but it's, you know, we, we're just aware of that, and it, but yet it can be really, really hard to see. You know, I sort of look, at it, I look ahead and think, oh yes, that's what the weather's going to be like, and then it turns out to be different, you know, and it's, it's or, or it's like this now, and you can't sort of imagine that it's actually going to actually going to change. But yeah, weather generally, we accept that weather changes. I mean, another thing that changes is um, things. <laughs> I was thinking about this in terms of appliances or stuff that you buy. You know, things you might have in the house. You know, like washing machine, computer, phone, anything. And it's just, but then I was thinking, well, actually, generally, the change in terms of those sorts of things is that they go from working when you get them to not working. That's the main change, so it tends to be a fairly unwelcome one. But again, it's, it's one of those things that we can see happening. You know, we, we, um, we sort of know about, you know, even planned obsolescence or whatever, but things, it's, it's one of those things that we can observe happening, things um, wear out or break. Um, uh, and then moving on, another thing that uh, changes, I mean, obviously everything changes, so I'm just picking out a few examples that seemed, that occurred to me when I was thinking about this. Um, so another thing that changes is our emotions. And depending on how um, intensely you feel emotions and uh, all sorts of other factors, that may be something that you're very aware of. You know, you feel up one minute, down the next, you feel this, you feel that. So it may be that you're quite aware that's changing or not. You know, it may be that, um, and one of the things that typically can happen is that, uh, particularly with a strong emotion or an emotional state, once we're in it, it's quite hard to imagine it ever changing or being out of it, you know, wh whether it's positive or negative sometimes, but normally 
with the more negative range of emotions. It's like, oh, and it's really hard to then imagine that that's, that's going to change. It can feel quite permanent and, and fixed and enduring. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've had that experience, and particularly um, when there's been a really strong reaction to something where it can actually, I can experience something, you know, say as strong as rage. And it's one of those things that it's just like, this is completely overwhelming. It's, you know, absolutely, this is all of my experience. It feels like it's just a permanent state. And then it's quite interesting to sit with it, feel it, and notice quite how quickly it can subside when you're just sort of taking awareness into it in the body rather than the, the story attached to what's happened. So yeah, emotions, that's another thing that changes. Um, but moving on as well in terms of um, another thing that we can look at is uh, our views or experience, uh, opinions, or the views or opinions of people around us. Um, that might be harder to see sometimes that those, that those change, it can feel like yeah, well, this is who I am, I believe this, I've got this opinion, these views. And it's, I think, um, one of the things I sort of, I'm aware of happening more these days is that there seem to be more views and more opinions, and we seem to need to know what we think about, about different uh, things. And, um, uh, yeah, and, but, you know, again, that is something that changes, you know, as we, grow older, as we have different experiences, as we are exposed to more things, our views can change, our opinions can change, even those that feel really, um, that we feel very wedded to, it might be that we get a broader perspective, a bit more empathy, it might be somebody, you know, we actually hear something really quite different and they go, oh, yeah, I hadn't really thought about that. But it can feel, you know, it's, it's an interesting one to reflect on in terms of impermanence because it can feel quite permanent um, and even more so moving on from sort of views and opinions will be our sort of tendencies we use the word conditioning a lot in in buddhism you know how we're conditioned how we're raised who we are um, which you know based on you know, how we were raised as a child, what life experiences we've had conditioned in that way. But our sort of tendencies and traits, um, again, those may be harder to see in the level of impermanent. They may be harder to see as impermanent. They may feel quite enduring. And particularly maybe tendencies that we would like to change. We're aware of that tendency. It doesn't really serve us. We'd like to be different. We see people around us who are different in that way, and they think, oh, that was a better way to be. I'd rather do that. And then it can be quite, you know, you see, oh, I've done that again, I've done that again, I've done that again. It can, it can feel like it's, um, it's one of those things where it can be harder to see the impermanence of it. But it's an interesting one to really interrogate and observe and be aware of, and also, you know, maybe be reflected back over time if you have friends that, uh, have known you for a long time, it can be quite helpful to have people reflect back, oh, no, no, it's really, you're really different in that way, or you used to do that, now you do this. But that's another area where things are, well, everything is impermanent, but that might be one where it's harder to see. And then the final one I had in the, in the list is, um, well, of course, life itself um, is impermanent ours, the people we love, our pets, everybody. I'm not going to focus massively on that. It's um, though I'll come back to a bit, a bit, it a bit in terms of how we practice around it. But you know, that's one of the sort of inconvenient, sometimes ultimate truths that it's um, of, uh, of impermanence that's all around us. So in terms of how we practice in relation to impermanence, so impermanence as one of these three lakshanas, the three sort of Buddhist understandings of how things are, uh, um, that everything is this impermanent, changing flow, you can't grasp hold of it, you can't keep it. 
Um, so the first aspect of how we practice in relation to it is um, just observing it, recognizing it. Oh yeah, change is happening. You know, whether we like it or not, you don't have to like it. You can just recognize that it's happening. And sometimes that's really obvious, like the sort of the sounds, the weather, things breaking, emotions perhaps. And sometimes it requires a sort of suspension of disbelief because you can't actually see it happen, changing. We're not, you know, we don't, so it's harder to see. I mean, one of the things is in terms of, um, you know, for example, tendencies and conditioning for people changing, whether it's us or other people. I mean, one of the things I tend to find is that that was one of the things, one of the gifts in a way of being a parent from a Buddhist <coughs> perspective is being able to see them changing, you know, small people, you know, children change quicker than adults, basically. So it was easier to see that truth of people of impermanence and change um, with uh, raising children than it is uh, necessarily in myself or, or in other adults. And some things, you know, when you look at, I don't know, a mountain or, a, you know, something that changes, you can't think that, you know, that surely that's a sort of solid, enduring, permanent thing. But um, so sometimes it needs a suspension of disbelief. It's just like, yeah, I can recognize that that is changing. And sometimes it's about observing it and seeing it. And it's very obvious. So that's the first thing, which I think is fairly straightforward. Um, and then the second thing in terms of how we respond. When I was thinking about this, I was thinking, actually, it's what's helpful, I think, is to move away from responding well or badly, good or bad. I don't mean that, not, help, not how we respond in that sense. But I was thinking about it in terms of a spectrum of response. And on one end, <coughs> there's um, a sort of uh, complete incred incredul incredulity, <laughs> incredulity? Anyway, you're incredulous. <laughs> um, you know, you cannot believe that this is really changing. How come this is, you know, what, you know, you're really, really surprised, can't take it in. <coughs> and on the other level of the um, other end of the spectrum will be a sense of equanimity, acceptance, peace. Yeah, of course. You know that it's perfectly fine. So how we respond to change will be somewhere on a spectrum from completely incredulous and um, maybe indignant or devastated or something right through to, yeah, yeah, this is all in the flow of life to be expected. I get this. That's all absolutely fine. And wherever it is your response on that spectrum of response well firstly wherever it is is totally human totally natural so as i say we're not we're taking it out of well you want to be this end and not that end it's not that wherever you are on the spectrum and particularly both ends of it are an opportunity to practice and whether you're you know identified as a buddhist and engaged in buddhist practice or whether you know, whatever it is that's motivating you to meditate or to explore this area, it's an opportunity to practice. And from the sort of positive, um, ha sort of happy end of it, this, it's um, the sort of opportunity for practice there is that, you know, things are changing and that feels fine and you're in tune with that. And um, that's a, an opportunity to practice <clears throat> in that probably the feeling tone of that is quite spacious and open. Um, you might have a sort of a lighter sense of, you know, self, you know, you're not holding so tightly to how things are. Let a lighter sense of needing to control or do or anything like that. Um, you're sort of more embracing change more in tune with it so you're more in tune with reality if you like and um you know one of the expressions you get in uh, english is um sort of that thing of kiss the joy as it flies you know, so just kiss the joy as it flies so it's like you're aware that this is fleeting perhaps but you are in tune with that and that feels feels fine um often people will report or we'll talk about having this experience more when they're in nature. And one of the examples I was thinking about actually was watching um, a sunset, 
you know, when you watch a sunset, well, there might be a little bit of you that's thinking, oh, I don't want this bit to end because now it's going into less intensity or whatever. But, but generally there is a sense of, of just wonder, of being with, of spaciousness, of openness, and just in, enjoying the, the display, the, you know, the sense of awe and wonder. And so it's, um, you know, that can be a real sort of um, opportunity, you know, in both of those ways of practice, both around, you know, one, you know, in terms of um, having a sense of sort of insight into how things are, a bit more clarity, a bit more realizing, you know, those moments in nature, those moments of spaciousness, of openness, um, awareness of change, openness to change, are just a real opportunity to really open. This is how things are, things are changing, things are flowing. Which is a, one of the conditions for insight to arise. It can be an opportunity to really relax back, be aware of change. So you're setting up good conditions for insight. But it's also helpful in terms of just getting a bit more calm, a bit more positivity, not, not just in fact, but you know, positive emotion, developing positive emotion, developing more calm. Um, we have as human beings a natural tendency to focus on what's wrong, what's going badly, what we don't want. Um, one of the, um, I've heard it expressed, you know, using the analogy of we're, we're um, Velcro to negative experiences and Teflon to positive experiences, you know, so anything. And there are there is research that backs this up in terms of quite how many positive experiences we need to outweigh negative ones. It's a very natural human tendency. We are wired for survival, so we are wired to see what we need to change. We're wired to see any see threat. You know, if everything's hunky dory, we don't really need to pay any attention. But from a spiritual development and a human point of view, it's very good to inhabit and be present to those experiences on that accepting, spacious, peaceful end of this uh, spectrum of response and experience. So that's practicing with this positive end of the spectrum. Um, when we're looking um, at the other end of the spectrum, where change is a lot less welcome, um, one of the things I was thinking is that when it's really acute, so when the change is acute, something bad is happening or there is something bad happening in your life or for people around you that you care about, when it's something that feels very acute, um, it's, um, you know, that isn't, that isn't a good moment to think, okay, I'm now going to focus on the flow of life and the impermanence of life and, and all of that and expect yourself to be fine with it. Cause, cause you sort of can't be from that sort of normal human relative experience. You can't be fine with a lot of, you know, with, if something, you know, with really acute things happening. So that's, um, and so what I was thinking of is where there's um, that sort of more, yeah, more acute end, bad things happening, you know, really the best possible outcome can be sort of like get through it and survive it. Um, maybe, you know, one of the things I always like is that don't make it any worse, you know, in terms of response, you know, try and respond in a way that doesn't make it worse. You know, I remember this a lot again with, Kids were a very good example of that. You know, it's like everything blowing up, tantrums and this, just don't throw, you know, more fuel on the fire. Don't make it any worse. Um, you know, or don't say something that's just really cross and irritable or, you know, to a friend, for example, just try not to make it any worse. You know, and ideally maybe being able to respond in a way that uh, offers what the situation needs or what other people need. But really, what I'm saying is that in those moments where something, you know, this, this end of the spectrum, change is happening, it's unwelcome change, it's painful, um, that's, that's the focus maybe just on how you respond, not making it any worse, just getting through it, being kind to yourself. So that it's a practice of breathing into it, feeling the body, feeling the breath, trying to tune into 
kindness to yourself, kindness for others in the situation. Um, and that's a very, very uh, strong practice. Um, so more the sort of using, focusing on impermanence as an opportunity for practice is, is more in the territory where things are not acute. It's not something really, really bad is just happening now or has happened very recently or was going on. It's much more if you think about those tendencies of, or partly the weather, appliances breaking, emotions, tendencies and views. You know, that can be those and, and our sort of conditioning. Yeah, th those, um, those can be really helpful. So not acute, but things we can be very aware of um, can be a very helpful way to practice. Um, so, and there, the sort of way we would practice with it really is to um, be with it, which you will have all heard if you've come along to anything at all, just be with it, turn towards it, see what's there. You're recognizing the truth of change. You're recognizing your response to that truth of change. And um, what can be, you know, and one of the things with it is um, that can be very interesting, uh, particularly from the sort of insight perspective, is um, to look directly at that, at that response, at our response. So something's happening or it's like, so you know, in this non-acute situation, you have this tendency, you know, for example, one of the tendencies I've worked with for many years is towards irritability or sharpness, tendency to respond like that, working with it, changing it, and then it happens again. So it's like, okay, this feels fixed, or look at, you know, looking at that directly. But it's very much like relaxing around it but being able to feel the response. So, you know, I don't want this to change or I do want this to change. You know, you're, the, the reaction is out of sync with what's actually happening. It, feel, it can feel acutely uncomfortable, um, but actually what can be really interesting is, is to relax around it. All of those thoughts that are, oh, what again, or I should be better than this, I should be a better Buddhist, I should be a better human being, you know, all of those thoughts aren't really where it's at, so they can just come and go. They're just superfluous, a superfluous narrative that isn't, isn't, isn't that useful in the moment, so you just allow the thoughts come and go. But that sort of feeling into that sort of inherent discord with the way things are, it's like, I don't want them to be this way. So something, you know, and also, or if something changes that we don't want to change, and it's just like with that, again, that sort of <clears throat> incredulous, you know, that incredulous aspect of it, but why, you know, this shouldn't break, this shouldn't happen. Should is a really useful word as well. Every time your mind says it shouldn't be like this, you're not, you're on that end of the spectrum on the responding to impermanence thing. It shouldn't happen, shouldn't be doing this. Um, so again, it's just human, it's, you know, the uh, invitation to practice is to relax, to look, to be curious, you know, and potentially, if you can relax enough and be curious enough, even be, it can also be quite amusing, you know, it's like, wow, that's a really strong response, you know, that's to something changing that, you know, so it's obvious that something in you does not expect it to change, believes it to be impermanence. And you can also, you know, within that, uh, inquire into it. This shouldn't happen, it shouldn't change. You know, is that true? Is it really true? Is it always true? You know, and all of that sort of inquiring into it can help us see through the, what we ex expect to be a solidity and permanence of experience a sort of assumption. It's really, really helpful to see where we assume things are permanent, even though we get it, you know. <laughs> I can say everything changes, and you're like, yeah, everything changes. And I mean, I can say it to myself as well. I'm not, you know, it's, it's um, but actually when we have these reactions, when we have these responses, <coughs> we can see, oh, right, I have this assumption and now it's changed. You know, and obviously, um, 
I mean, sometimes that change is welcome. But just a sort of a word of caution within this, with this sort of looking at it, when you're looking directly at this discord, this discomfort around change, you know, I wouldn't recommend you do it for long. And also it's best done where there is a context of, of meta, of positive emotion, of meditation, of a bit of calm, a bit of space. And if it's if there's a lot of tightness around it or it's too uncomfortable, just stop. You know, so you might just do it for a couple of minutes and then come back to breathing into the body, um, bringing in uh, more metta. And that is another way to just always respond and always practice with this uh, truth of impermanence is to bring, you know, come into the body, bring in this sense of calm around it, trying to relax the body, a sense of metta, of acceptance, positive emotion. So, to conclude, um, impermanence, the first of the three lakshanas of impermanence, insubstantiality, and uh, unsatisfactoriness, all intimately intertwined. You cannot really separate out any of them, um, but a really sort of core fundamental teaching and truth uh, within Buddhism. Um, but yeah, so this first one, impermanence, change, um, <clears throat> some of it's easy to see, some of it isn't, some of it is welcome, some of it isn't. But from um, a practice perspective, uh, what's important to focus on is, is how we respond to it. So being aware of, um, just aware that change is happening, aware that that means it's not permanent, it's impermanent, uh, aware of where we are in that spectrum of response to change, from incredulous to um, uh, accepting and equanimous, and then wherever we are on that, it's an opportunity to practice, you know, whether this is within meditation or it's in nature or it's in daily life. And the opportunities um, for practice are both in terms of what's termed, you know, samatha, calming, uh, you know, positive emotion, more calm, more spaciousness. Um, and also the, so that sort of insight, the pasana aspect of it, where we're looking directly at it and seeing that sort of sense of, of discord, which is that something in us expects permanence, even if intellectually we don't. We are responding as if it should be that way. So looking at that directly in the way that I was describing. And we need both of those aspects of practice, you know, on the spiritual path. And at some times one will be more useful, uh, will be more relevant than another. Um, and, and very much that sense of um, calming and introducing acceptance, kindness to ourselves, positive emotion, can go a very long way to um, sort of alleviating the distress or suffering we feel in response to change. But it can't end it. You know, to end it, you really need that also that insight aspect of it, where you're sort of seeing uh, the truth of it uh, directly. Um, you know, and even then, you know, you can still feel sad in response to change. But what it means is you're ending that additional optional layer of suffering where we add all the it shouldn't be like this. I don't want it to be like this. All of those extra extra bits to it. Um, so I'm going to end there and see if there are any questions, but that's an a introduction to the impermanence and how we work with it uh, anywhere we are on a Buddhist spiritual path. <laughs>